Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandalmongers podcast. And welcome to the sixth episode. We're really getting the, into the swing of things. And I think we have a bumper uh, issue today. We have a bumper issue. We have a we, bumper myth-busting, scandal-rich issue. Indeed. I think about the most extraordinary two months of the of the war. Well, yes, we're talking about the Second World War. We're talking about 1940, the most mythologized year, perhaps in British history, ever. I mean, I was intrigued. A friend of mine who's a historian said that we know less about this period. Um, mo- more of it has been covered up than any other period of history. Goodness, well, we're going to peel back a few layers of the onion today. But first of all, I think you will share my excitement in me introducing my new audio aid. Because professional broadcasters, as we are now, have to have like a sting, like a special exactly. Sting to yes, punctuate this may the be the new, the, the, the new, the new gimmick. So, ask me how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? You know, well, that could get boring really quickly. Let's not do that <laughs> I again. I think once is enough. <laughs> <laughs> but you have something else. Um, uh, I think you're going to give us an impersonation of one of the key figures of 1940. Well, yes, if you'll indulge me being theatrical again at the beginning of the show, this is a great scene setter. I'm going to uh, channel my inner Winston Churchill and deliver one of his speeches from the summer of 1940. Not one of the famous ones, not one of the ones you see on the films. But I think, and I'm going to make this case in our podcast, perhaps the most important of them all. <clears throat> Take it away, Sam. It is with sincere sorrow that I have announced to the House the measures we felt bound to take. I leave it to the judgment of Parliament, I leave it to the judgment of the nation, and I leave it to the judgment of the United States, the world, and history, whether we were right or wrong. And the Commons rose to acclaim him. Now, what was he talking about? Well, I think this is the first moment in some ways where he gets popular support in the House of Commons. I mean, we have this great idea that that he had the support from May 1940. He didn't. And, you know, seeing the Chips Channon's diaries and other things, that's that's confirmed. Absolutely right. Uh, but this, in some ways, is the, the, end of the, the, be, the end of the beginning, isn't it, for, in terms of what we're going to talk about well, in today? In terms of Churchill's role as a war leader, I, I should just make clear, that speech was his announcement of the attack and sinking of much of the French Navy, the French who had been Britain's allies two weeks before. And and indeed, the sailors had been socialising together literally days before. And this is one of the really unknown stories of the Second World War, Operation Catapult. It is, Operation Catapult. And it's a big part of what I want to talk about um, today. Um, And it's a very unusual way, I think, of telling the story of this very celebrated summer. I mean, we think of the Battle of Britain, we think of fight them on the beaches, we think of the Blitz. But actually, there are events that took place weeks before the Battle of Britain even began, which I think are actually even more important in terms of Britain's position in the war, and more importantly, I think, America's position in the war. Exactly. I think we we feel it was, you know, we were all united, we were all fighting Germany. And this ties in with my own recent book, Traitor King, on, on Edward VIII, um, because if you put the two timelines together, there's actually, you begin to see the bigger picture. Oh, they absolutely overlap, and that's why this is such a cool thing to talk about. I'm really focused on the attack on the French fleet. You know an awful lot about the Duke of Windsor and what was happening with him, and it was all happening at the same time. And I think that's the pivotal month, I mean, late, July, late June through July, I agree. Really important. And before the Battle of Britain. And I think also there'll be myths that we shatter about how likely a German invasion would have been, given the story is really about sea power rather than air power. It is, very much so. Um, well, should we go back to the yes, beginning, if you back. like? Um, May 1940, the fall of France. This is a shattering moment. It's hard to exaggerate how shocking this was to Britain, to the whole world. I mean, the French had fought for four years in the Great War. They had a massive army. They hardly lasted four weeks. And the Maginot Line, which was meant to stop, keep everyone out. Exactly. Um, it was spectacular. And Hitler, of course, had already swept through Belgium and Holland, he'd taken Norway, he'd taken Poland. There was a sense that some new irresistible force was at large. And they were very clever, the Nazis. I mean, their propaganda was magnificent. 
they'd filled the airways for years before with, with, with great, beautifully made propaganda films showing the kind of serried ranks of stormtroopers, their fantastic tanks and planes. And actually a lot of it was, was hype. Their military was, was actually quite primitive in many ways, but it really did frighten people. Well, also, I suppose they knew that, you know, there was a very strong group of people in Britain who were sympathetic to uh, uh, the Nazis or certainly to, to some sort of rapprochement with, with, with the Germans. Well, if you think about it, what had they seen? People had seen Guernica. People had seen the bombing of Warsaw, Rotterdam. There was an awful lot written about terror bombing and what it could do to a city. And some of the, um, some of the predictions were almost like nuclear war level. People talked about hundreds of thousands of deaths in a night and a complete psychological breakdown of the population. As it happened, when the Blitz did strike London, it wasn't that bad, but people were terrified. And I think that's one reason why there was such defeatism around at that time. And also, it came right from the top. I mean, not just the Duke of Windsor, but the royal family had been strongly pro-appeasement. I mean, the policy of Chamberlain had been supported right well, up to... Talk to, a little bit yeah. about that, because I think a lot of our listeners and viewers won't know this. Um, Chamberlain is famously the... the Prime Minister who tries to appease Hitler. But around him in the Conservative Party and the ruling class, there's a there's all kinds of things happening. Yes, I mean there's a very strong feeling that the, the first war the, the, the you know the, the, the terrible things that happened in the First World War shouldn't be repeated, that these were Anglo Saxon nations who who in a sense saw the real threat coming from the Soviet Union, that the Empire would be put at stake if they went to war, uh, that somehow the Nazis could be accommodated. Uh, and you know, in banking circles, uh, but particularly in aristocratic circles, there was a sense that that you know, this shouldn't be repeated, and everything should must be done to, to to avoid it. And clearly, someone like Hitler couldn't be appeased. And we see, I think, interesting parallels now with Putin, and and again, the sort of appeasers trying to do a deal with 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 Putin, uh, and and the plucky Ukrainians who are fighting their cause. And in some ways, it was the same then. Uh, and so the Duke of Windsor, at least before the war, was not very different from a lot of his colleagues. But I think the thing that struck me very, as interesting in my research is, is just the number of senior politicians, people like Lord Halifax, who was foreign secretary, who were still prepared to engage with the Germans even after the war began. And this is part of our story of the summer of 1940. It is. Um, and it's funny, we spoke on our last program about some members of the ruling class becoming obsessed with the, t the dictator in Moscow, thinking that this is the future. But also, of course, many people looked to Hitler and Mussolini and thought, well, they seem to be doing quite well. We've Trains are running on time. Trains are running on time. And also, it has to be said, Hitler became known for his dislike, hatred, and, and finally genocidal hatred of Jewish people. And there was a lot of prejudice against Jewish people in France and in Britain, and perhaps in the circles around the Duke of Windsor. Is that true? Yes, I mean one of his best friends was was Oswald Mosley. So, uh, and certainly in the course of my research, Oswald Mosley being Britain's leading fascist. Sorry, yeah, exactly, uh, uh, and very, very strongly anti-Semitic. And actually, funny enough, looking at papers in the National Archives this week, seeing that those views continued, and 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 he was being given money by various Americans even after the war to pursue this. Uh, his anti-Semitism. But yes, absolutely. And I think within within British society, and we've seen this even in recent recent years, there's a very strong strain of anti-Semitism. So we have a ruling class that is a little bit sympathetic to Hitler, certainly frightened of carrying on the war. France has collapsed. A lot of clever people, and by no means they're all bad people, but they would call themselves pragmatic people, thinking, well, what's the point in carrying on? And the British Expeditionary Force on the retreat and trapped at Dunkirk. Yeah, I mean, that must have been the most incredible... I mean, people talk about COVID as a challenge to government. Can you imagine being in charge when your allies are being defeated, your army is about to be destroyed, and all around you, in your own party, and even in the war cabinet, people are starting to say, should we fight on? And don't forget, Church has only been in power for, what, three weeks, four weeks? And, you know, has very little parliamentary support, uh, is, is a pretty discredited figure. I think what was fascinating talking to you just before the show is, is, is in some ways how dodgy his reputation was. I mean, financial shenanigans, corruption, you know, we see him as this great statesman-like figure, but, you know, he was a man of straw in many respects. Well, and he'd had a, a history of bad decisions, especially military decisions, and people always bring up Gallipoli, rightly. Um, but of course, as, as 
as time would tell, he was the right man at the right time for this role. His belligerence, alcohol fueled belligerence, um, romantic, impractical belligerence is perhaps what was necessary. But the practical men around him, so you mentioned Lord Halifax, there were many others, were already in May, June thinking, we just need to get real here. We need to talk to the Germans. And of course, the Germans and the Italians, because the Italians have also entered the war to make it even worse for Britain. Um, start putting out these feelers for a soft piece, they call it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's extraordinary. They're coming from, but also through intermediaries in the Vatican, in, in Switzerland, in Sweden, uh, and elsewhere. And I mean, it's it's fascinating to see just the number of people who are having meetings with people like Halifax and his deputy, Rab Butler. Um, and you can you really get a sense of actually how beleaguered Churchill must have been. Oh, yeah. And, of course, the thing we haven't talked about is America's position in this. Well, that's right. I mean, maybe we're rushing ahead a little bit, as we tend to do, because we get too excited with our stories, but um, Britain's actual military position is slightly different, in my opinion, to the fears that people had. Um, in recent years, quite a few writers, I would include myself with this book, which is available for your Christmas purchase, by the way. Recommended. Thank you. In, in, available in all good waitresses. And indeed, all waitresses love it. Um, but also other writers, um, rather more successful writers like James Holland and David Edgerton, have also in recent years tried to look at Britain <clears throat> through the, um, the, the sort of prism of its enemies, looking at Britain's strengths rather than it as an underdog, you know, the empire, the massive navy, huge resources, and the very, very great difficulty of mounting an invasion. Um, it's really hard to mount an invasion, especially um, if you're Germany at that time with a very small navy. So all of that is true, but never discount fear and the kind of mass psychology of the time. Yeah. And especially, as, as we said earlier, there was this kind of sense that Germany was something new, something irresistible. And, um, you know, what's the point in fighting the inevitable? Because um, it's easy in hindsight to see everything, but as, as you say at the time, I mean, given what had been happening, it, it, it seemed that they would sweep into Britain within weeks. Well, it certainly felt they might, and even if they didn't, the, the, there was a double side to the fear, the terror bombing. They've got this terrifying air force, we think, that could r raise our cities, destroy, kill million, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in a night. They have U-boats. Italy's joined the war. Italy's got a big navy. Will they be able to blockade Britain? Will we just basically be an island starving while we're being bombed to bits? Which is sort of what happened to Germany at the end of the First World War. Which is exactly what happened to Germany at the end of the First World War. And, you know, given everything that Hitler achieved, who's to say he couldn't pull that off? Um, and at that particular moment, and now we're still in May and June, America is looking on. And Churchill is a very sensible, um, you know, he knows the balance of power in the world. He really needs American aid. He knows it was critical in the First World War. He's got a relationship with Roosevelt, the president. He reaches out to him and says, we need help. We need a public sign of your support for Britain. And he gets nothing. He gets absolutely nothing at first. Well, it's difficult for Roosevelt. I mean, you know, there isn't a great deal of support in America for the war. There's, there's a sense that, I mean, this very anti-British feeling, particularly with the empire, uh, and actually, the Democratic Party was made up of a lot of people who were not necessarily sympathetic. There's a strong Irish contingent. Uh, and it's, so it's not just real <clears throat> politique. There's, there's a sense that that's your problem, mate. I couldn't agree more. And I think that's one of the great myths that we should be busting in this episode. Of course, we know that Roosevelt and Churchill made a great alliance. We know that America and Britain became great allies in the Second World War. But from the perspective of 1939 and 1940, you could not have predicted that. It did not have to happen. Um, there was very little love for Britain in Roosevelt's party. Um, Irish voters, German voters, Italian voters in America. Why would they want to support Britain? Um, well, we forget also the strength of the isolationists. Exactly, America first. Again, d d d traces of Trump. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's up for re-election. And, and the last thing he wants to do is to affect that. Yep, he's got an election coming. America first, which is this group that says we should keep out of foreign wars. They're hugely popular. His own party looks at Britain with suspicion. And they, particularly because of the empire, actually, you know, they, they blame Britain and France for the sort of policies in trade that helped make the Depression in the 30s really bad. They also well, were, were very... Protectionism, you know, yeah. Protectionism. And they were also very unhappy at some of the things that were happening in the empire, like 
um, protesters in India being shot in the streets. You know, this was not a good look. So in some ways, you know, this is going off on a tangent, but the relationship with America is still quite tricky even by the end of the war because the Americans see the war as being fought to, to, to break up the empire. But so I think that's, that's right. another the, program. Well, it is another program, but it actually affects them at the beginning too because they, you've got people in Washington saying, well, why should we give our money, our ships, our moral support to an organization that we don't like? And, and a lot, I've read loads of books by American reporters who came to London in 1940. They came to London to write the obituary of an empire, and they did it with some relish. And they, at the time, didn't necessarily see a huge moral gulf between Britain and Nazi Germany. That sounds appalling to say that, because we know now what happened. We know about the Holocaust. We know about what happened in Russia. But at the time, if you had to choose between the two, a lot of Americans might have felt, well, six of one half a dozen of the other. British, British listeners might think this is appalling, but I could point you to so many people who said that at the time. Yeah, yeah. It did well, change, and it changed in 1940, but it, it's true. Because of Churchill. But because of Churchill and because of what happens. But also, I think, I mean, the point that I think you make is it is about naval power. It's not about air power. You know, difficult to invade Britain, uh, but even with the Luftwaffe, because um, the Navy is still the greatest Navy in the world. Yeah, we have a huge navy. It's very hard to invade us. Even if the RF was totally destroyed, it'd be very, very hard to mount an invasion. Um, um, so, uh, which is why the French fleet becomes so important. Well, the French fleet does become very important. Um, but I think the reason FDR is really anxious about sending ships is partly because in his party people are opposed to Britain, but there are other others uh, around him in, in the pen, in, in the military saying. Why would we send ships to a lost cause? And don't forget, <clears throat> a lot of clever people who are writing in American newspapers at the time think that Britain is a lost cause. America's own ambassador, Kennedy, in London, says it'll be over in weeks. They're going to have to do a deal. So why would you want to risk your own political position, possibly break the Neutrality Act, by sending ships to support, or, or anything, to support a country that's about to lose? That's Churchill's dilemma. And in some ways, all the actions he takes the next few weeks are pr 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 focused on bringing America in, in, in at least some sort of support. Now we get to the heart of it. You see, this is why I think the events we're talking about are as important as the actual Battle of Britain. Because what we're about to discuss is the, is the pivot point in American attitudes. Um, I think by the time the Battle of Britain started, the Americans had already begun to turn. And... Certainly, the Battle of Britain encouraged that. Um, Britain became seen, rather than an imperial overlord, it was seen as more heroic, as an uh, underdog. But actually, the most important things had already happened. So let's get deeper into it. Um, actually, before we do, with, in terms of the French Navy, I think we should jump back to your area of expertise. Because the Duke of Windsor is being courted by a whole load of spies at exactly this moment. And what do you think they're about? Well, the, the Duke flees when the Germans are advancing on Paris. He's based in Paris. He's been the uh, uh, liaison officer to the French First Army. In fact, there's some suggestion he betrayed some of the French defences, which he'd inspected to the Germans through a man called Charles Bedo, who was a friend of his and a Nazi agent. But he, he escapes down to, to Spain uh, and eventually to Lisbon, where there are flying boats due to take him back to Britain. There's a great concern he'll be kidnapped. But he plays for time when he gets there, and there's people can't quite understand it. He makes excuses that his valet, uh, who's been called up for military service, needs to be brought back, that he needs to be, uh, Wallace needs to be given the title for Royal Highness, they need to be entertained at Windsor. Uh, and he's he's using, in some ways, this as a negotiating ploy, um, uh, and driving Churchill mad, of course. This is, the, we're now talking about the end of June, 1940. But most people think that Churchill was a great fan of the Duke of Windsor and never wanted him to abdicate. Well, it's certainly true. Churchill was very romantic about the monarchy. He was the leader of the King's party during the abdication uh, and had hoped that he would stay. I mean, he, in fact, became very disillusioned with him for a, a series of reasons. He said, first of all, our cock won't fight. He didn't have the Duke, to, as he became, didn't really want to, to, to be king. Uh, it appeared. But also, when it came to the financial settlement in the spring of 1937, he realized that, that the Duke of Windsor had not been completely honest about his finances, so he felt pretty betrayed by that. 
And then uh, as the war begins to, 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 to really take off after the Phony War, he realizes that his loyalties are, are not to, to Britain, uh, that he has been intriguing against the government. There's a point where he comes back in the spring of 1940 before Churchill comes to power, and actually he's working against Church against Chamberlain with Beaverbrook. Of course, this has all been reported back because Windsor actually has a spy in his own entourage, his own special branch uh, um, protection officer who's reporting back. So this. So we are the British government is effectively spying on its former king. Absolutely. And in fact, this has gone right back to 1935. King George V had put uh, MI5 surveillance onto both Wallace Simpson and the Duke. It revealed that they were both having affairs with other people at the same time uh, and allowed them to monitor them. And actually, they're huge. Uh, there's a huge amount of material in the Royal Archives showing this monitoring going right back to 1935. So there were no illusions about the Duke of Windsor, even up before the abdication. And why are, why are these German agents so keen on him? What do they want from him? Well, what happens is is, is he's in Lisbon. This is a, a sort of neutral uh, spot. It's it's filled, I mean, a wonderfully exotic position, but filled with German agents. Uh, and he falls into the hands of a man called Ricardo Desperito de Santo, who's a banker, who's also basically in the pay of the Germans and goes to live at his house. Uh, again, he's spied on there by the Portuguese. We have the Portuguese surveillance reports from their intelligence services. Uh, there's a suggestion that um, other people in the entourage, including possibly his butler, are reporting back. And um, he becomes, some would say, a pawn in another game. I would say a pretty active intriguer because he he's basically he's flattered by attentions from German agents through Spanish old Spanish friends of his who are, who are there and who say to him um, you know if if we if the Germans invade Britain they will need a figurehead puppet king and you would be the perfect figure and his head is turned by this he it's partly to get back at his brother this, this huge antagonism between the two but there's also a sense of bigging himself up in front of Wallace, of perhaps regretting the decision to abdicate, the feeling that this may be the, the way to go. And he even tells one of these um, Spanish intriguers that actually the best way to subvert Britain is to bomb it. Uh, I mean, it's chilling stuff. Well, I think uh, I, mean, I was reading your book. That was on the 25th of June. Yeah. So, I mean, we're in the middle of the war. It's the, the moment the paint of the picture, Churchill is feeling undermined. He's not sure he can rely on his own cabinet or his own MPs. And we're at the time of Dunkirk. Dunkirk has, has, has happened, but it was a damn close run mm. thing. And it's very, very febrile and people are very nervous. And here's the former king saying, bomb them. Mm. I mean, don't we call that treason? Well, I mean, my argument is that he should have been charged with treason after the war. But of course, that was all covered up um, again by Churchill. But, you know, there was a, that was a bigger problem. That was for the state of the country, that the last thing we could possibly have is a former king of the country being charged and probably executed for treason. Good Lord. So this is going on at the same time. And actually, there's one week where Churchill is pretty busy because he threatens Windsor with a court-martial. Uh, uh, he's clearly trying to, to do... And we're still in the last week in June, aren't we? We're... we're, we're we're still sort of in the last week of June, yes. Uh, in fact, the, the court-martial comes slightly later, but, oh, right. but he's dealing with, with, with this problem. Well, the other extraordinary moment um, is on the 17th of June, where a, a, one of Halifax's confidants, his aide, Rab Butler, meets this Swedish minister. They have a walk in St. James's Park, like in some kind of spy film. And he tells this Swedish minister, Bjorn Pritz, I think he's called, Yep that Winston Churchill will not have the last word on Britain's position and no chance would be missed to reach a compromise peace if reasonable conditions could be obtained, knowing that would go straight to Hitler. Yep, yep. No, the height, this is the height of all these peace negotiations as they through these different channels. There are lots and lots of people coming in and lots of people being entertained by, by you know, cabinet ministers. Sam um, Hoare is another one. Uh, so, uh, and this is all going on behind Churchill's back. Well, um, you know, according to another source, in, I think it may be in your own book as well, he tells another Spaniard, this is the Duke of Windsor again, which I think must reflect the views of his circle, that the whole war was actually um, not Germany's fault at all. It's the fault of, quotes, the Jews, the Reds, and the British Foreign Office. I mean, this really is treason. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, I mean, I think he generally held those views. I mean, right to the end of his life. I mean, this is one of the game, the, the myths about the Duke of Windsor, you know, that he was not this benign figure. He was actively intriguing against this country at, at our darkest moment. Amazing. That is, I mean, I find that astonishing. Um, if, I, if it wasn't so annoying, I think I'd use my little sound effect. It's an outrage. <laughs> it's a scandal. But let's go back to the thing that I'm most focused on, because we've set the scene, I think, perfectly. When all of this is happening, literally the same week it's all happening, the French fleet suddenly becomes a bargaining ship. Now, I've already said the Germans haven't got much of a navy, but they've got the Italian navy now. And the French navy is way better than the Italian. It's powerful, it's modern, and there are lots and lots of... If he gets that, if Hitler gets that, then it really could change the balance of power. And this becomes a real focus for Churchill, but also for Washington, uh, people in Washington. They don't want Hitler having this amazing navy, especially if he then gets the British one as well. I mean, oh God, that would really terrify them. Yep. So uh, France and Germany are now having peace talks. Paris has fallen. Um, and naturally, the French fleet is a bargaining chip. Churchill says to the French government, you mustn't promise me you'll never let the Germans have it. And they do promise him. Yep. Most of it is sent abroad to bases in North Africa, in the Caribbean. Some of it comes to British bases too, um, and West Africa as well. But as, as days go on, the British keep picking up really troubling details from these negotiations. One of the critical ones is the French had promised Britain, and don't forget we were, we were still formally allies in a war at this point with the French. They promised Britain that all of the German prisoners they'd taken, including some brilliant Luftwaffe pilots, would be sent to Britain. But guess what? They're all released, back in German hands, ready to fly against the UK. Why did the French do that? Well, they're in a terribly bad position. You know, they have their own problems with defeatism, and some leaning members of the French government are also, like, like we've described in Britain, quietly sympathetic to some of the things Hitler says. And as we know, they go on to form a regime called Vichy, um, which is collaborationist, which betrays its own Jewish people to the Holocaust, and which ends up fighting a war, not many people know this, against Britain in 1941 and 42 in, in, the, far, in the Middle East. So I think, I think basically Hitler held all the cards. And so Churchill is now wondering, well, if they're doing this, do I trust them on the status of their navy? What am I going to do about it? I mean, you know, the, the risk is too high. The stakes are too high, isn't it, to, 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 for any sort of, of, of leeway? Well, it, it, but it's also a great opportunity for Churchill because he's still talking to Roosevelt. He's badgering him literally every day about these destroyers. He wants these 50 destroyers as a... These are old American destroyers. They're in mothballs. He wants them because it would be a wonderful uh, reinforcement for Britain against U-boats, but also it would be a massive public sign that America is finally coming off the fence. And Roosevelt is slightly warming up, but he's still rather reluctant. And But they end up talking about the French Navy. Now, I did a documentary on this, as well as this book. I did a documentary about 10 years ago, um, uh, which I must put up on our yes, little page. Yes, very good. It's very moving. And I think the wonderful thing in the documentary is you caught many of the people involved in these events who are still alive at the time. And it really brings the whole thing alive. Oh, and, it was an amazing project, actually. And, and the bitterness that, that, that was still there. Well, years yeah, there is. Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, but we also found, did some genuine digging. We found some great documentation, which shows that Britain's ambassador, Lord Lothian, sits down with Roosevelt last week of June and says, more or less, how would you feel if we took the French fleet out of the equation, if we did something dramatic and Roosevelt says, more or less, I would like that very much. So this is a big moment. They've kind of got the American president's attention. And it would, of course, remove a massive problem for him if Britain could take the French fleet out of the equation. Um, so they launch... Well, actually, before I go into Operation Catapult, there's another quote I want to read you, just to show um, just how bad things were and what needed to change. Um, this was an American journalist who I followed, um, a very influential one in the Democratic Party. And on 28th of June... So what's his name? It's called Ralph Ingersoll. He writes this in a very influential paper. Twilight hangs heavy over the British Isles. 
The anxiety of the world produces rumours. Rumours that England may sue for peace. Stories born of the grim proximity of death that stares all of England in the face. Are there rumours? Maybe, yet one wonders. Just to show where the world is, where America is thinking the world is. But anyway, that's why I think more than anything, he he launches this operation against the French Navy. It's to secure Britain's uh, place as a dominant naval power, but it's also to really impress America that we mean business, that we will be ruthless, and that he's in charge. Because maybe if they're in the Caribbean and North Africa, can they really be of any use to the Germans? I mean... Well, they can be sailed back. Um, You know, Admiral Darlin was the the most important French admiral. If he told his captains to to go back to Toulon, and there was still quite a lot in Toulon, by the way, but they would have done, I'm sure. (laughs) Um, I think the thing was nobody knew what the French would do, and there was a kind of desperate sort of um, vagueness to all of this. And, I mean, in some ways, from what I understand, the French kind of, are not entirely open with the British about things. And so, in some ways, things begin to take on their own sort of inevitable narrative because of that. Do you remember that in the Falklands War, there were all these peace talks whilst the task force is at sea and winter is coming and they're just spinning it out. And everybody thinks, well, what if something terrible happens? What if the carrier gets sunk by a... We need to sort of seize the moment, <clears throat> and which they do with the Belgrano. Now, there's something a little bit familiar in this story here, because basically, how long is Churchill going to wait? Especially when he knows that the Americans might be moving in his direction. So he launches this, it's called Operation Catapult. It happens in multiple locations. Does it happen in Toulon? It does not happen in Toulon, because the, that's become still part of France. It happens in Portsmouth, in the Caribbean, in West Africa and in North Africa. Lots of French ships are seized. There's a shootout in one of them in which some French and British sailors are killed. That's in Portsmouth. But there's a really big squadron in this harbour called Merle Kabir on the North African coast. Um, And we send a very big task force there called um, Force H um, under the command of um, admirals who are very unhappy. This is why it was seen as a scandal. They didn't want to do it. They're complaining all the time. Churchill personally writes their terms of reference. Um, and he, he gives this, um, I guess, ultimatum to the French commanders. So why is, why is this North African port so important? I mean, when, when there isn't a great deal of bloodshed elsewhere? Um, well, I think it's because um, the particular French commanders there are quite truculent. It's not very nice to wake up and see your f- allies, effectively, suddenly, you know, a couple of miles offshore with battleships pointing at you, saying, we have a message from our prime minister. And I think a certain amount of pride is at stake. You know, don't you trust us? Who who are you to challenge our word? Um, They're also trapped in the harbour there, aren't they? So there's not a great deal of room for manoeuvre. They are. They're literally trapped in the harbour. They're they're in no fit state to fight a battle. But what they're told, and this comes directly from Churchill's own pen, it's it's a single paragraph. We offer you these options. A... Sail with us today to continue the fight. B, sail to a British port. C, sail to a French port in the West Indies or the United States. If you refuse these fair offers, I must with profound regret require you to sink your own ships within six hours or we will do it ourselves. I mean, that seems fair enough. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's dramatic. It's quite a lot of options there. Better than the, the, the final option. Well, yes, but of course, and there is negotiation, and and these people know each other. And you you mentioned my documentary. We interviewed some people. They they they'd been drinking in bars in Gibraltar with each other, you know, weeks before. They'd fought battles with each other, and it was as, as allies against the Germans. And but so it, they have to negotiate, and they 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 all shaking the French hands. Don't really have a have a very strong negotiating hand, do they? they They're trapped in the harbour. The battleships are outside. They don't really believe it's going to happen. Subsequent communications reveal that, well, two things, actually. One, they don't believe the British mean it. And two, they think, and this is the more the conspiracy side, some of them who are more pro-German, because there were pro-Germans in the Navy, think that the Germans have been tipped off and are going to turn up any minute with their U-boats and sink the British fleet, which, of course, is another reason why they didn't want to hang about. Yeah. 
Um, and that's like the Bill Grano scenario again. And after two or three rounds of negotiations and shaking hands and drinking wine, it sticks out the whole day. Basically, the French say we're not moving, and they start to steam up to come out, to, 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 so as to be ready to give battle. And a message comes from London. I mean, it's not clear who drafts this, but Churchill was almost certainly involved. Set, it says, this, this is the, the exact quote, and we know you're reluctant. This is to the admiral in charge from London. But we, what, what date is this? Uh, this is the uh, 4th of July, um, I think. 3rd or 4th of July. Um, we know you're reluctant, but we now require you to get, this is the best bit, settle the matter quickly. That's what they say. Gosh, and there's a moment in your documentary where the, the, the negotiating officer from the British, you, you, he's being filmed, leaving. I think they, they must do it on the French ships, and he's leaving to go back. Yeah. And, then, and he knows that within a very short period within of time, minutes, all these people he's been talking to may well be dead. So, um, I've been very theatrical this episode. I'm going to read just a paragraph from my own book, because it just this is what happens. At 5.54 p.m., from a range of 17,000 yards, HMS Hood opened fire, followed by HMS Valiant and Resolution. Each ship fired 12 salvos, 144 15-inch shells, each weighing three-quarters of a ton, shrieked through the air and exploded in the harbour. As they passed over the cruiser HMS Arutha, Arutha, ahead of the battleships, each shell sounded like an express train going through a tunnel. The first salvo fell short. The second hit the breakwater, showering the French ships with concrete. The third struck the Britannia full in its magazine. It instantly exploded and the ship turned over. 1,012 people died on board that ship. Gosh. Other ships are blown to bits as well. I mean, it's a bloodbath. 1,300 at least are killed, including some nurses as well. Um, It's impossible to know, but it's it's possible that more French were killed in that hour than the British had killed Germans at sea in the war up to that point. Yeah. I mean, it was such a dramatic and astonishing thing. The people who did it were ashamed of themselves. We interviewed some of them years later. They felt shame. They felt... Did they go rush to their support, I mean, after that? Because, I mean, it it seems a bizarre situation. You just shelled them, and then you come and, and pick them up. Uh, no, they didn't. They just they fled because they were scared the U-boats were indeed coming. Right. Um, there were there were enough French people uh, around to give aid. Because in fact, one battleship wasn't hit, so actually, it didn't, one escapes didn't do the trick. One escapes actually. Um, yeah, we invent. You know, the French still. We were talking now about 2010, so it was 70 years after the events. We're still angry. Why did they do it? We thought they were our friends. The British we interviewed. Said, well, we were, t- you know, we, it's that old thing. We were only obeying orders, but they also, I think, believed that it was a, a necessary a moment for necessary brutality. And I read that statement that Churchill made in the House of Commons, and actually, it was a turning point with his own party because I think people realised he was fully in charge. He was going to fight on whatever the cost, um, and he was prepared to be utterly ruthless. Um, and actually. All of these things are happening at the same time as the story you've been telling about the Duke of Windsor. And I think that same ruthlessness he shows there by threatening to have him court-martialed. Well, exactly. At the end of July, um, he threatens him with court-martial. He gives him a choice of, 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 of that or of being sent off as governor of the Bahamas to get him out of the way. But one of the ironies is he then comes within very uh, short distance of America and he begins to interfere with the isolationists to try and persuade them to stay out of the war. And so Roosevelt is engaging with him on the spot, uh, and there's there's clearly tensions there. Uh, and the Nazis continue. I mean, uh, he says as he, as he goes to the Bahamas, to, to these Nazi agents, you know, the, the moment isn't right now, but I'm prepared to come back uh, if required uh, and, and take my place as, he, as your puppet king. Wow. Um, so, you know, even at that point, even after the threat of the court-martial, he's still prepared to engage with them. And we know this because of what, what are called the captured German documents. These were the communications between the 
German um, Foreign Office and their ambassadors else, uh, abroad, particularly uh, in Spain and Lisbon. And so we get chapter and verse of what was going on, what was the, 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 the talks that were taking place. And there's a big attempt after the war by Churchill and indeed Eisenhower to ensure these papers, which the American historians want to use uh, for purposes of history, to use the Nuremberg trials, are suppressed or even destroyed. And I think some of them are destroyed. Uh, but eventually... That's to defend the reputation of the Duke or the family? That's to protect the monarchy. That's oh. to protect the reputation of the, of the Duke. The, the, you know, they just can't let the story out. And there's a great battle between ac American academia and, in a sense, the, the establishment to, to suppress this bit of history, back to our old theme of censoring history. Wow. Uh, and it's only in 1957 the stuff comes out, it's downplayed, uh, and to this day it's been downplayed. Uh, and, I mean, uh, what amazes me is I think the, 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 the court-martial of the Duke has never been mentioned in any book until I wrote it last year. That's uh, phenomenal. And that's been sitting in the archives for 40 years. So what is it about historians? Do they just turn away from things that don't suit their purposes? Are they too keen on their OBEs or, 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 or are they lazy? I don't know, Andrew. I don't know that. I mean, that's genuinely surprising. It's such an enormous story. And for it only to be published in 2021, yeah. after what, 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 80 years after the events. Yeah. Well, that's I mean, that's what's so exciting about history. I mean, here we are constantly myth-busting things that we think the story, people think they know the story and they don't. Yes, um, you know, it's funny to talk about ruthlessness, the, the sinking the French fleet, threatening the Duke of Windsor with court-martial. It's the same week, it's actually 2nd of July, there's a terrible incident. They've rounded up loads of Italian and German civilians. Some of them are Nazis, many of them aren't. Some of them are anti-Nazis. But in, in the atmosphere of the time, they were all interned, and they started sending them to Canada. On the 2nd of July, there's a ship, the um, Arundora Star, it's called, is sunk by a U-boat, as many ships were at that time. And on it, 800 German and Italians die. And many of them were people who come to Britain looking for refuge, but also they wanted to fight Hitler. <laughs> and, you know, it's terribly sad, and these things do happen in war, um, overreactions. Well, the um, whole internment story, particularly in the Isle of Man, is, is, is probably another episode that we should be looking at. And I'd like to. I really would like to do that. And, of course, America had its similar horrors with the Japanese. But also, I suppose what we've got here is, you know, the military prerogatives, but also there's a propaganda war being played. And, there and is. And actually, it's funny because this attack triggers a kind of war with France, um, which people don't know much about. But there's fighting in West Africa, there's fighting in Syria and Lebanon. Um, and, it, and obviously, it's great propaganda for the Germans and the Vichy regime. Um, the French resistance, when they f first tried to set up in 41, 42, they don't get very far. There are posters everywhere about this event saying, the British killed our sailors. Don't trust them. So that was a bad consequence for Britain, but the really big good one is America. FDR is delighted. This, I mentioned that man Ingersoll with his newspaper editorial. Yep. He writes another one. It's only about three weeks later. And he says, I am so pleased to report that the British have taken away these dangerous toys. I, for one, now am finally ready to send weapons to these brave men. What a turnaround. And there's a very famous cartoon, which I, I used to have, I think it's in my attic, uh, and it's in this Democratic newspaper, and it's got Chamberlain's umbrella floating in the docks, and in the distance, the Royal Navy going out to fight. And it's like, that's a turning point. That's a big turning point. But he strikes a pretty hard bargain, doesn't he, Roosevelt? Oh, he does. We have to give him loads of bases, but we do exactly. get the destroyers. Yeah. And it does set the, you know, it starts the ball rolling towards the Atlantic Charter and Lend-Lease, and the relationship will always be troubled, and there'll always be suspicions on both sides. But the absolute pivot point, I believe, is the events we've just described. I agree. I agree. And the story, of course, continues. Uh, I mean, Churchill is, is again trying to show his, his ruthlessness by uh, um, basically imprisoning a lot of people, including Mosley. There's a sort of big yeah. big campaign to, to, to bring anyone who might be a, a potential, potential threat to the government, you know, to imprison them, uh, including members of parliament. Uh, I mean, he really is very, very ruthless. And I think we have, perhaps don't realize just how desperate um, the, the situation appeared. Well, I'm glad we got to talk about this because I, I'm one of those people that feel that, that um, movie, The Battle of Britain, you know, really over-romanticizes the story. And 
um, portrays Britain as being way weaker than it was, and the RAF actually as being way weaker than it was. Well, I mean, Richard Overy and others have written about this, haven't they? I think, and, and, and historians are looking at that again. But they are, and they I think are. you know again the fascinating role played by Beaverbrook. I mean, the, the, with his aircraft production. I mean, once, and it shows that war is is a lot about just resources, isn't it? Once we had we we could replace the the, the, the aircraft as quickly as we were. I think the problem was the shortage of pilots, wasn't it? And then yeah. we got them from Poland and elsewhere. But, but Britain's fundamental strengths, you know, shouldn't be underestimated. Certainly the RF was formidable. The Luftwaffe had never met anything like it, and they were beaten pretty comprehensively. It wasn't a close-run thing, the Battle of Britain. But my point about the year is it's not really about planes. It's not even really about ships. It's about psychology. It's about fear. Churchill had to turn that around. People thought it was impossible. We were up against supermen, invincible new machine age supermen, like something out of a Fritz Lang movie. And to persuade the cabinet, his MPs, the people, America, that resisting was possible, that's the, his genius that year. And that's why what we talked about, both with the Duke and I think with the French Navy, is a turning point. And then when do you think the turning point is when, when we, we feel the war is won? Is it when America comes into the war? Is it after Alamein? Gosh, that's a big is question. It, is it something maybe with the future? I mean, in some ways, what would be fascinating is to have listeners say what they would like us to talk about or investigate or who we'd like to have. Who Indeed, they like this to. is a very different show, actually. We talk, you know, we've not done anything this distant in the past, I don't think, yet. 1940, that's a long way back for us. It is. Well, but I we wanna, do. I we want do, to go further back, I don't we? I want to do Nelson and Emma Hamilton. Now, there's yes. a scandal. Yeah. That tells yeah. you a lot about a certain time in history. I think there's so many good stories and, 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 and where the story hasn't really been properly told or has been told in a particular way. Uh, and there's a lot more to it. And, of course, there's always new research coming and new interpretation. Right. Well, we're on the lookout for that and we're yeah. looking forward to your feedback. And I think we've probably reached the end of this episode. But please let us know what you think and what you'd like to hear more about in the future. Sounds good. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 